This is Popping the Bubble with hosts Sandra Ponce de Leon and Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Sylvia Gorayek and this is Popping the Bubble. Hi, well thank you so much Sylvia. We're so excited to be here today with Sylvia Gorayek. She is a Polish entrepreneur, also the host of Valley Talks, a startup founder yourself, and you've had a lot of experience working with companies here in the Valley, such as Apple and Netflix. So thank you so much for joining us. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. And actually, I'm here in your home. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Well, yes, I, and thank you for having me too on your show, right? Okay. So we're both thank you. Thank together. yous all around. <laughs> I'm completely fascinated by your journey because you came here from Poland just a few years ago, and um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what brought you to Silicon Valley. Tell us about your journey. Okay. Well, obviously, I was always in love with America. I've been here uh, several times before I moved here. I have family on the East Coast and some family here on this coast too. I was dreaming of, you know, of moving to America someday. But actually, when I was in Poland, it didn't kind of seem like that's going to happen. I was studying there and then I had I was working there too. So I didn't think, you know, this would happen in any way. But somehow for my university, I chose a major in English, mm -hmm. psychology uh, in marketing and advertising in English, just in case that helps uh, when I need work in America, maybe. Mm -hmm. So you didn't necessarily know you were coming, but you were setting your intention for coming. I was kind of hoping that this may happen someday, but, but you know, that was just somewhere in the dreams. And, and then I met Jacob, who is a video producer. He had his own, he still has his own company in Poland. So I started working with him on the video production projects. I always wanted to actually work in the advertisement industry, but also implement the psychological processes mm -hmm. into that. Mm -hmm. I was always fascinated by how advertisement influences people's minds and their decisions. So I really was excited to join him on working on those uh, productions because he was mostly producing films for corporations. And so, you know, we started working together and... And Jacob is... Jacob is my husband. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was later. Okay, yes, okay. <laughs> but actually, yeah, that's true that our passions for sure, you know, bonded us together. We actually started on working on some totally independent projects, no budget for music videos that I wanted to produce with Depeche Mode founders. I'm a fan oh my God, of Depeche I Mode. I love Depeche Mode. I am a huge oh, fan wow. too, yes. yes. So you actually were doing videos for Depeche Mode? Yeah, I mean, not of course like uh, officially hired by them, but I was doing videos with the fan base okay. in Poland to their songs. So Jacob kind of volunteered that he would help out. I was looking for help on Facebook on the, some of the fan pages that I created when I was, that I was running for the Depeche Mode fans. So he, he decided to help and we're laughing until today that he helped as much as, you know, we got married and moved to America together. So That's amazing. You never know. Yes. Okay. So actually we, we created one video, then another video that actually was also uh, a big success, I must say, in the Depeche Mode fan base world. It had several hundred thousand views wow. and we were having great comments that it is, this is much better than the recent Depeche Mode official videos, for mm -hmm. sure, which actually, you know, is true and, and many people can, even non-Depeche Mode fans, I'm sure, admit that. But that we, it was actually a very much in the theme of the former videos produced by Anton Corbin, which Jacob is a huge fan of, and me too. So it was a great feedback for us. And we were working also on the corporate projects and we created a film studio in Warsaw, which is there until today. And, and it's being also a place for other people to to come in the industry and produce their own films too and, and other clips. So that's so cool. By, by working on this passion project together, you had this passion for Depeche Mode and you also started to understand about what it takes to drive virality in social media. Of course. And um, we were running this fan group 
So that's pretty cool. Yes, and, then and that, there was a lot of content marketing, as I know right now. Obviously, I was doing there that then just, you know, intuitively, but it made a huge impact. Actually, uh, mentioning that, I co-organized, I was the initiator and then co-organizer of, of fan actions on concerts on, on the arenas in Poland. So it, they involved like 30,000 people that were participating. So wow. that was also very big achievement I think yeah well this is something so see I didn't even know this about you and I think mm -hmm. it's so fascinating and I love Depeche Mode my first five CDs that I ever had were every Depeche Mode album oh really yes <laughs> so oh, I'm a wow. huge fan <laughs> okay so we need to talk about that yes, more <laughs> we do we do we do <laughs> after the podcast so yeah. okay so Depeche Mode led you to video production to social media how did you make the jump from Poland to Silicon Valley you know what Actually, it's simply sad, but actually, of course, like very hard to do. It's just that we decided one day yeah. that we're moving here. And, you know, some of the newspapers that were in Poland covering our stories, they were I, also like right, summing up it like Jacob would say, you know, pack your luggages. We're moving to America, you know. So <laughs> it's kind of obviously we could summarize it this way because that's really what happened but obviously there were a lot of things on the way but yes we decided actually okay I can say Jacob decided one day that this is the year that we are moving because there will never be the good time to do this mm -hmm. and we were both kind of dreaming about this. that's so cool yeah that's so cool so you made the leap we did you know first of all we we came here for kind of like a longer vacation to to meet people already in the industry I was reaching out to everyone you know, I found attractive online, some other video production studios, mm -hmm. and we knew we had a very good quality portfolio. So we kind of hoped that they would be interested, you know, about meeting in meeting us. So I was just Googling and, and reaching out even from Poland wow. before we came here. And so then we had 20 something middle meetings scheduled within two months. That's amazing. Yes. So we, so we were meeting people here and in LA and and then at the end of our this first stay here which we call vacation we drove from san francisco to la and then to chicago and new york wow. and from there we flew back to poland and on that way we also recorded a music video for obviously one of the depression <laughs> songs that is so cool i can't wait to see these i cannot <laughs> wait to see these videos i'm going to post links to them as well cool <laughs> yeah. yes that's so cool. So did you know that that you were going to be coming back to Silicon Valley? What made you decide on Silicon Valley specifically and the type of work that was fascinating to you? Jacob has a brother here. So we we knew we have the support during the first, you know, weeks or the first period to to stay with him, but also from the meetings that we had, we had more meetings in LA than here. Mm -hmm. But actually from those meetings we had more follow up and you know something really specific coming out over here than in, in LA so it was just making sense for us to to come here and to explore the network that we've already built and build more and also our expertise or maybe the portfolio was you know with corporate brands mm -hmm. in video production not necessarily featured films and festivals so we knew there is just so many corporations and businesses here that it will be just a you know actually a bigger market for us mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. than LA. Mm -hmm. That's why we chose Silicon Valley. But at that point, it was not startup world yet, right. or building your own product app or anything like that. It was video production, but yeah, it made sense for us more. That's really cool. So you went back to Poland and you guys came back and and established yourselves here in Silicon Valley, but then you also began your own startup yourself, right? We did. That was a, a little, you know, a while after. In the first place, over here, we we built another video production studio. We totally copied model we knew very well from Warsaw. Mm -hmm. And we knew that, you know, and also the economy here is much more friendly mm -hmm. than in Warsaw to build your own business and your own film studio, for sure. Mm -hmm. Because the ratio of cost of the equipment to you know to the pricing that you can set up for your services is is you know is a lot better here mm -hmm. so we were very excited about just 
copying the model, but with better resources. Right. And we did that. We we had we we opened the studio, but actually. I still had in, I, then I started to know more about the startup world and mm -hmm. investors and the opportunities. And I couldn't let go the idea that I had in my mind when we were actually travel, traveling uh, from LA to Chicago through Route 66, just two of us. And I had an idea for an app and that I was just waiting for someone to, to build, to create. I was, I would never expect that I'm going to build it myself. Mm -hmm. So I had that idea. We had the film studio and, you know, we, we had the business established and we started to actually like on the side start working on, on the idea and on the app. And then we met more people that maybe, that maybe had a bigger network or already some knowledge in the startup world. And we just went for it. And when we raised funding, we decided to go for it full time. Amazing. Wow, that's so cool. So what was that startup all about? What was the big idea? So that's a hyperlocal messenger called Spray. Uh, Spray. And actually the idea that I had, you know, back then was very general. And then we obviously shaped it all together with a team. And the general idea was that I want to be able to connect to talk to people that are around me without knowing their contact information. You know, because we're meeting so many people and crossing, you know, our paths with so many people around us. And we could talk to them about so many things that are just, you know, this location specific maybe at the beginning. Right. But we don't necessarily need to know their names, who they are, you know, where they work, what they do, what's their network. All we care about is the location. Mm -hmm. So that was the idea for the app. That's how we built it in the first version. And, and I still believe in this, in this concept because there isn't anything that really serves this purpose yet. So basically enabling serendipitous conversations between strangers. Yes. Mm -hmm. And was there any type of conversation that you thought would be more relevant for that kind of hyperlocal setting? Would mm -hmm. it be like, tell me the best coffee shop nearby, or what's the best bar, or what kinds of conversations were you imagining happening, or what kinds of conversations did happen? I, I imagine you launched and yes. were live, yeah. So, you know, the, the, the first use case that I had in mind was obviously my own when we actually got married in Las Vegas on that way, still oh coming gosh, back to that wow. trip. And that was kind of spontaneous, but, you know, planned somewhere. But this was on Route, on the Route 66 yes, trip. Yes, on that trip. So we were so excited and, you know, we wanted to celebrate this, but we were just two of us on that <laughs> road. And we were visiting all those small towns along the way. We were not taking the, you know, we were taking as little highways those big highways as possible because we wanted to explore those small towns. So when we were stopping in those small towns, we wanted to just celebrate with the locals. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it would be much easier for us to reach out through an app than just poking them in their arm, you know, <laughs> right. and just saying, do you want to celebrate? Hey, let's party. <laughs> you know? With this app, you could just spray the message and then just wait for replies and people that are you know, interested and want to do that, they, they will reply. So one of those use cases would be to, to just invite people that are around you to something mm -hmm. or, or yes, or ask them questions or maybe ask them an advice without being forced to really just bug them in person, mm -hmm. which obviously, you know, is good to do sometimes because then you meet that people, but some, you know, the barrier is there too. And for us as not Americans from people that were there for vacation, it was very hard to, to just, you know, talk to, talk to strangers on the street. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the use cases. Obviously there is a ton of more because you know, it's all about interaction with people that are around you, but that's how we started. And that's, really cool. that's how we, I love it. that's how it's it started idea. to be used too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's so many times when, Either you're traveling alone or you're in a new place and you just feel like being social. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. there are apps like that, that, that show you people who are around you and then you can choose who you want to talk to. Mm -hmm. But that's one more step that you need to do. You need to kind of make decisions on who right. they want to talk to and why. And then those people don't want to share any information. So why just not to skip all that? So was it just anonymized completely? No, it, you wouldn't know what gender, you wouldn't be able to see a picture or anything like that? You wouldn't be able to see anything about people who reach the message. But then if they reply, you, you, you just, you see them, you see their names and their profiles, okay. but they already replied. It means they, they are okay with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Very cool. I like the idea. So what's, is it still alive and kicking? What's going on with it? It is still alive. It's, I'm sure it's growing. I don't know much right now because I'm not there at the company anymore. Mm -hmm. But my dream of having this launched and people using it and, you know, making connections was done. So that's, that's what really matters to me. Yeah, no, it's awesome. It's basically you just dove right into the startup founder journey right upon getting here exactly. pretty much exactly yeah. yes and learning uh, uh, all about it just while just going through it yeah wow that's amazing well it seems like you're fearless you and your husband to just make the jump all the way from poland and also with starting your startup which is so cool so i guess that kind of leads me into my next question is you've been here in silicon valley now for a while and You've been doing, you've, you've launched your own talk show, which is called Valley Talks. Mm -hmm. So what is it that really fascinates you most about Silicon Valley? There is several things, but, you know, one of them is like people say, I can confirm it's true, that over here people are just so helpful and friendly and they really want to talk to you about your maybe dilemmas mm -hmm. and they are happy to help. They, I think that they are kind of also proud that maybe they've gone through something similar and they can share it. And I've met a lot of people that are really super eager to share their knowledge. Sometimes you need to actually try, you need to filter that too, because mm -hmm. you get so much input that you need to kind of then make decisions which of them is actually helpful and relevant to Right, me. right. It can make you jaded, especially if they've had negative experiences and they're trying to yes. give you warnings, don't do this, that, the other. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that's another end of, of this story that you need to you you have all the information but you need to filter all that too so that's a skill also that you know it's hard to learn but also i just learned about this being needed here mm -hmm. too because mm -hmm. taking everything that people advise you can also lead you to something you know not necessarily that you want it that's one of the things that really fascinates me and i think what goes along with that is actually the courage and you know, I feel like I've also had a lot of courage in, you know, in you have, just absolutely. taking, yeah, taking lots of, uh, um, you know, just when you have an idea or a dream, just go for it and just don't waste any time. So I, I like this surrounding. I, I totally didn't know that it's going to be like that. I, you know, as I said, I didn't come here for the startup world for something else. So then I realized this is happening and people are just so courageous having their ideas and, and just building those uh, teams. Not necessarily, I wouldn't even advise to build a company right away. Uh, I would go more for like build the team and and just try to start with something small. But they are doing this and and they are, you know, doing whatever they can to, to achieve what they want. Uh, you know, it's very expensive here, but also so many people are just renting a room they, tr they making there sacrifices. Are, yes, yeah. making, making sacrifices. There is so many people that are, you know, 35 years old and, and still, you know, like having roommates, living in a community and, and just, you know, reaching for their dreams. So this is something that fascinates me enormously here. That is so cool. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with you, definitely. I think I've, I grew up here in the Bay Area, so I've had the advantage of having access and seeing seeing this happen all my life but uh, you know and also being inspired by it so um, it's really cool to hear your perspective and so so what led you to actually think about this talk show and putting these stories out there what how did you make the leap from coming here doing your own startup working in the video production world to now I want to help these founders tell their stories Yes, yeah, so it's all combined and actually comes from my startup experience. I don't think I would have Valley Talks without that experience. Mm -hmm. And what's maybe interesting is that, you know, I started my startup without having a lot of knowledge about startup world. And, you know, I was so focused into our on our own business and product and, you know, the growth that, you know, that it was also hard at you know, many times and I was worried that maybe I'm doing something wrong or, you know, I have these problems and we maybe should grow faster or, you know, just build things faster and faster and, <laughs> and, you know, make all those better decisions sooner. And actually only after I left the company, I 
I realized that all other people are having very similar dilemmas. Although mm -hmm. they have very unique, you know, businesses and, and, and products, they also don't really know what to do at times or make bad decisions. And I started to listen to more podcasts, also referring to Silicon Valley and startups. And I just realized there are all those stories that are there are not really maybe told because media mostly focuses on success, like huge success mm -hmm. or a big you know, momentum, but they don't talk about all the backstage of how it's being done. So I feel like if when I was doing my startup, I would love to hear other people's stories and how they are building their own things, not necessarily when they are billionaires, right. but when they are you know, maybe on the same stage or maybe a little later mm -hmm. than me. And I don't think there is such a show out there from Silicon Valley. There is a lot of things you know, that are around this too, but I'm totally focusing on, the, on those uh, founders and their startups in Silicon Valley. And I'm doing this in a video format, which is which I haven't found another talk show like that. Mm -hmm. Right. So really acting as a resource to other people that want to get into technology or found their own companies and telling those behind the scenes stories so that they can learn from them, the stories that you wish you'd heard. Yes. Yeah. Uh, like as an e-resource and maybe also like just friendly hand, you yeah. know, just to, just to let them know that, hey, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. Other people are struggling too. Here is how they got to where they are. We obviously, you know, highlight all the successes and all the good decisions they made, but also just, yeah, just letting them realize that it's not only them making some mistakes or not knowing what to do. Right. Yeah. We're all in the same boat. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, so now you've had, how many interviews have you had on Valley Talks? Oh, I stopped counting, <laughs> but I think it's around like 30. Okay. That's great. That's great. And you've been able to interview some really awesome people in the space and founders. Who's your, who's your favorite interview to date? Yes, many people ask me that, but I it's hard for me to answer because I I really love all of those interviews and and each of them was very different and the stories are different, but actually one of them that I'm very happy I did is on the expert side with attorney that represented Facebook mm -hmm. in their famous lawsuits in 2008. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy that Mark agreed to join me on the show. You so had Mark easily. Zuckerberg. No. No. No, you had one of the lawyers. Yes, one okay. of the lawyers, Mark Howitson. Okay, got it. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I got excited there for a moment. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes, because that's the first the same name. No, yeah. Um it's Mark Howitson. He he agreed very gladly. He came to San Francisco to do this. He shared, you know, his uh, knowledge and some of the insights on how it really was, you know, during that Paul. So know, these were the lawsuits amongst the founders? Amongst the, the, the founders and also there, there were two and the other one was amongst the, the Mark Zuckerberg and... The twins. Yes. Yes. Mark Howitson was representing Facebook in those lawsuits and we were talking about things to pay attention to or take care of just not to, to avoid those lawsuits. Right, don't leave those loose ends loose, so to speak. Exactly, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. Mm -hmm. And we were analyzing, you know, if things could have maybe gone differently and just warning on those very early, you know, moments of the company, it's very important how you, how you set up some relationships or, you know, some collaborations with people. And obviously you don't think about that because you're so focused on your product and idea and or maybe you're still in college. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. And maybe you don't even you maybe you don't even assume yet that your company is going to big or product big. But whatever, you know, however it ends, the beginning always needs to be taken care of. Mm. And that's what we are paying you know, a lot of attention to in our conversation. And I think it's, it's, it's a very valuable knowledge. And I wish I, I, I knew that when mm. I was starting my own. Yes, because it's, these are very common uh, things. That yeah, are happening. very common mistakes that happen. Yeah, that's great. And maybe uh, when it comes to my, you know, some of other my favorite ones on the founder's side, side I, I very much enjoy the interview with Julia Caudray founder of People, 
uh, the app that went very controversial in very media. Very controversial. I, I'm not sure if you are aware of the story. Um, it was a rating, a people rating app, right? Yes, that's <laughs> how she hates this to be <laughs> called. But yes, she understands that that's, you know, the, the fastest way that people are understanding this and obviously shaped also by the media in a way that went very negative on the concept, mm -hmm. not even on the product yet or, or you know, it was just in still in the it wasn't even available to public so her story is incredible and she was very sincere i think in giving her answers and very like responding in a very deep way and i really appreciate that and it's a very yes and this is one of the interviews that i enjoy, enjoy a lot because i don't think that you know, if I were in her, sh her shoes, I would, I would manage to move on. Hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's definitely, there's the, the roller coaster that she went off the roller coaster she right kind of before like she even threw got her on. out of the roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is, is the, is, I mean, what is she doing now? Is she still involved with companies? Is company yes. a success? Or? Yes. She's, she's growing it. Mm -hmm. She, I think she's now in, in San Francisco because she's kind of, you know, traveling between San Francisco and Canada. I think she's back here right now and probably we're going to meet up just to, you know, catch up on what's going on. But yeah, she's 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 moving it. But, you know, I can imagine that with such a, you know, such a... Negative perception. Yes, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's much, much harder for her right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, she was also launching it in the context of those other apps like Whisper and Secret that were also getting a lot of negative press with the anonymous mm -hmm. feedback and moving into bullying. So she kind of, the timing was probably hard. Got wrapped up into all of that, I think, Prob from what I remember. Probably too. Uh, but I believe in her concept. I know what she wants to do, and it's a very smart approach. It's just very hard to tackle. This is something that would be great to, to, to be there, to function, but to make it work properly and all of those things is just, it's just very hard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. That's cool. So uh, you've had so many different conversations with founders and entrepreneurs and learning lessons, obviously. I guess what's the most surprising thing that you've learned? Kind of mentioned that already, that I was surprised that people are having the same problems, but I can say it maybe once again in a different way. Yeah, or if there was one particular learning of all of the mm -hmm. founders that you've oh, spoken from, to from that, my interviews. that okay. was, you know, more surprising than others. I think that the the Marx was is very interesting. I think a very important lesson to keep in mind yes. is to be aware at the beginning and to tighten up all those loose ends. Is there anything else that was sort of a surprising or caught you off guard from any of your conversations? There is one conclusion that I that kind of confirms along all the interviews is that there is no one recipe for your success. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we're going through this, we may think that it's so hard for us and we it's hard, hard to figure out. We're trying different things and we, we, we maybe haven't found it yet. But actually, it's just what everyone is going through. Mm -hmm. It's not that someone else is building their business and they know it right away. They are just, you know, like thriving into the growth and success and all that. Although it may seem so because that's how people are talking about it. It's like selling, you know, their experience and their brand. But actually everyone is struggling, you know, maybe for a shorter or longer time. But that's it's surprising to me too because previously I was kind of thinking that probably for everyone else it's just easier. And it's mm -hmm. just me who has, you know, all the dilemmas and maybe have done some mistakes. And it's, I, think it's, I think it's very optimistic to know that everyone is going through this and... And just not don't get um, a refreshing. Yes. Yes. I, okay. Yes, I get what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's also a function of our society today and our culture with Facebook. And I think everyone presents this very happy, shiny persona, right? But um, and you're not going to put you hardly ever put anything negative that mm -hmm. happens to you. And I think for founders, that's just amplified because they have to be at the helm and they have to be providing this sense of confidence, really fearlessness that everyone around them needs to get behind, right? So it's kind of like society plus their roles uh, together that makes it even you know more magnified, that, pre that pressure. Exactly. And so this was surprising to me, but also 
I'm very happy that my guests on my talk show are willing to share those experiences. And, you know, most of them are already kind of in the past and they kind of, you know, uh, figured it out. And, but still, you know, this is something that will be very hard to, to find somewhere else you know, in the media. So unless they are billionaires and already famous people, it's easier for them to share all the mistakes I had. But also founders that are right now in the moment of, of you know, building their momentum, I'm very happy that they understand the, the mission behind this and they want to share this with, with my audience too. Yeah, that's really cool. All right, well, so uh, going along that vein, what, you know, what is, you know, one of the mistakes that, that you've learned along your own journey that you would want to share with other mm. entrepreneurs? Oh, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> uh, yes, but you know, there, there are several of those. And well, I think that one of the, the biggest one and most important one is not to focus in, you know, too early on building the infrastructure and, you know, finding the office, paying for, for legal services and just spending money and time on all the things around your product but really we're probably I don't, I don't you know it may seem that this is more like a trend but i think it's very smart to just totally go to your room if you want a garage that's fine mm -hmm. but just eliminate all the other things costs and things that would just um defocus you and and work on the primary idea and validating that mm -hmm. and if of course you know uh, businesses need money and funding and all that but actually spend as much time as necessary in the beginning on thinking of how to create a draft of your working product or you know mvp as we call it right mm -hmm. or prototype that you can validate this on you know start with 10 people you know it's it's great if you have a hundred but but do do this homework at the mm -hmm. beginning mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, instead of uh, just building everything else and the product along along this because it it's just uh, sometimes it may uh, have you know it may happen that it just all was waste of money or time maybe right right Who maybe are you solving your problem for, for I think that you know uh, in thinking about some of the companies that are coming to market recently I read an article on Forbes about how um, you know, we've got these services, on-demand services for, you know, getting your laundry done, getting your groceries delivered. And the author actually made a comment about how it was mom, all the services your mom did for you on demand. Exactly. <laughs> and it's like, you know, the, you know, are you solving a problem for yourself or do you have a wider audience that you're actually solving a problem for? So I think that that's very important and very mm -hmm. much in line with the whole lean startup methodology, yes. MVP, minimal, minimum viable product. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. and that's also what investors want. Mm -hmm. They want, they don't want to see, you know, pictures of your office or even of your team. They just want to know how you are making sure that what you're doing is solving the problem. And, you know, now when you know this, maybe it sounds simple or easy or just obvious, but when you are you know, building your own startup, it's, it's hard. Right. And it's easy to get distracted with the wanting to have an official presence and getting that office. Then you start to get bogged down in administrative and operational functions mm -hmm. that are not core to your technology. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that I think I could have, I could have cut some costs or time on spending on those things when I was building my startup. And now my husband is building another startup. And I'm happy to say that he really, he uses his knowledge and experience really well now and does it in a very, very different way and something that is, you know, I think is very promising and very important to implement into mm -hmm. your own startup mm -hmm. to try to really work on your idea and validate it first mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than on the company. Yeah, that's great advice. So you, you recently wrote an article um, based on one of your conversations with investors related to what it takes to get funding in Silicon Valley. So can you just share some of those tips that you've learned from your guests that might be helpful for other people that are embarking on their own journey? Sure. I'm still coming back to one thing that I mentioned and one thing that you know gets, gets repeated in my interviews and also from investors that you, what they want to see is 
how you validated your idea. Mm -hmm. You think that's number one? I think that is number mm -hmm. one. Okay. Probably another, I mean, going together with who is your team. It's not about, you know, having already like 10 people in your company. It's all about actually the founders, who they are, and if you worked together before, what's each of the founders' expertise, and they really want to know that you're an expert in doing this. And some of the investors say that more than the idea and the product, they pay attention to the team, if mm. not all investors. Both of those things are probably equally important. Make sure that the people you are teaming up with look very credible in the investor's eye. Mm. It's harder to, to, to raise money when it's just your college friend. Right. Or, you know... Unless just... you're out of Stanford or MIT or one of the... Probably, yes. But this, I've never... I haven't actually heard that they really pay attention to, to, your, to the university that, that you, that you graduate, graduated from. It's really about what are you expert in and whether you know each other mm, mm -hmm. because they know that you know even the best idea or even if it's already have funding and and all the structure is there but if the founders are not the best team to work together everything will just go to the trash mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that's what they really pay attention to and that's also one of the things that i that i didn't know before i thought that the idea is the core thing hmm. and since you have a brilliant idea okay we need to invest in that that's not there on the market yet we'll help you build this and it's going to be amazing but but yes the team is the most important thing and how you are proving that your that your product is needed out there yeah i think these are the most important mm -hmm. messages from what i hear good advice good learnings from your own experience and all of these amazing conversations that you're having with founders and entrepreneurs well, Sylvia, it's been an amazing conversation and thank you so much for joining us and we will continue to watch Valley Talks. You know, keep on learning from your own conversations and with entrepreneurs and founders here. Oh, thank you, Sandra. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to speak to you and to be here. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you.